so hey guys, uh, this lecture is going to be on uh, graph theory. So sort of a quick introduction to graph theory. Um, a graph is just a collection of vertices connected by edges. So you can sort of think about it as like uh, we have here, you have like circles that are connected by lines. Um, and you can sort of intuitively think about it as like roads between cities um, or like a social network. Like um, if two people have an edge between them, that means they're friends or something. Uh, th there's all kinds of like applications for this kind of structure. Um, and usually in uh, CP problems, we add a couple of restrictions on the graph. Uh, so we can't have two edges between the same two vertices and we can't have an edge from a vertex to itself. Um, and a graph with these restrictions, we call it a simple graph. And that's what you're gonna see in like 99% uh, of CP problems. Okay. So there's also a couple of different kinds of graphs we can think about. Um, so on the last slide, we were looking at an undirected graph where sort of the edges go both ways, um, right? So like, if you think about that as um, like a social network or whatever, that means like uh, two people are friends, that means they're both friends with each other, right? Or if there's a road, then that's like a two-way road. Uh, but we can also have the edges be directed, um, like in this picture here. Uh, so it sort of represents like a one-way road. So like you don't necessarily have an edge in the other direction. Um, you can have an edge in both directions here, um, but it's not always a given. Like we could also have an edge from two to four. Okay, and uh, we can also make the edges weighted where every edge has some cost associated with it or like some length or something like that. Um, so like in this example, like this edge has a cost of three, such as a cost of two. Um, and then you can sort of ask questions like, uh, what's the minimum cost we need to get from, say, three to four? And then that would be 10, right? Because you, you can either do 10 or you can do uh, 13. So anyone have any questions about sort of the basic definitions we have so far? All right, cool. So now uh, we can get into how to implement this for CP problems. So the first way to do it is you can do an adjacency matrix, uh, which is basically if you have um, a matrix uh, n by n, where n is your number of vertices of zeros and ones, where if you have an edge between i and j, then you set a i j equal to one and uh, zero otherwise. All right, so like if you look at this picture, um, we have like an edge between one and two and an edge between one and three. So we set those equal to one uh, same thing between two and three, two and four, same thing there. Um, and so a couple of things about this. One, uh, you'll notice that for a undirected graph, this is gonna be a symmetric yeah. matrix uh, because if you have an edge between I and J, then you have an edge between J and I. So you can sort of flip it over the diagonal and you get that symmetry. Uh, but if, it, if it's a directed graph, then we're not gonna get that symmetry. Um, and another thing is, uh, if you have a weighted graph, you can also put the weights directly in here in place of the ones and zeros. Um, so like if all of your, oh God, one sec. Yeah, this is inefficient, but I guess it works. Does this present from here? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so if you have a weighted graph and you're guaranteed that all your weights are greater than zero, uh, you can put your weights in here in place of the ones. Um, and that way you don't have to like store your weights in some like external data structure or whatever. Um, yeah, so the, the one drawback with this is that it's uh, O of n squared space. Um, and the way we usually get around that is by using an adjacency list instead, which you can kind of think of as a compressed form of the adjacency matrix. Uh, where for every vertex, instead of storing um, this array of all n values, where like a bunch of them could be zeros, right? Like if you only have one edge going out, you're still storing n things for that vertex. Um, but yeah, instead, we're going to replace that with only a list of the vertices you are connected to. Uh, and what this does is it brings you down from n squared to n plus m space. 
right? Because, uh, for example, if you look at this graph, it would have like this adjacency list. Uh, here, here, M is the number of edges. That's the canonical yes. way you talk about N is the number of vertices and yeah. M is the number of uh, edges in the entire graph. Yeah. And uh, so you'll see it's N plus M because um, every edge we have here, so like the edge between two and three, is going to appear exactly twice in these lists, right? Because you have three appearing in the list for two and two appearing in the list for three. Uh, so the total number of elements here is going to be um, uh, 2m. So that's your m space. And then you have the n space because you're sort of allocating this whole array. Uh, so even if you have no edges, you still have this whole array of like empty vectors, uh, which will take up your n space. So this gives you n plus m space. Now, in the worst case, this doesn't really help you, right? Because you could have edges between every single pair of vertices, and then m equals n squared, right? Um, and then that doesn't save you anything from the adjacency matrix. But usually in like code forces problems and whatever, uh, you'll see that n and m are both bounded by like 10 to the fifth or something. Uh, so if your n is really big, you're guaranteed that you don't have n squared edges. And then uh, n plus n space works. And n squared space would not work in that case. And so the way you can uh, implement this for reading input specifically um, is you have uh, an array of vectors. So a vector in C++ is basically just an array list in Java, um, or just, you can think about it as like, yeah, basically just an array list. Um, and so we have this array of vectors where each one uh, is for a different vertex. Um, and then we usually read in the number of uh, vertices, n, number of edges, m. And then for every edge, um, if they give you u and v, it's like the two endpoints of the edge, um, then we want to put u in the list for, we want to put v in the list for u, and we want to put u into the list for v. So pushback just appends it to the end of the list, basically. And note that this is for an undirected graph, right? Because we're adding the edges in both directions. Um, but for a direct graph, we would only be adding them in one direction, right? So we wouldn't have this graph v dot push back u, because the edge would only be from u to v in that specific case. Uh, and similarly, if it was a weighted graph, then instead of just storing a single int, you would store a pair of ints to represent the second endpoint and then the distance for that edge or the yeah. cost for that edge, which you would yeah. also so instead of yeah, instead of being a vector of ints, it would be a vector of pairs here. So you'd have like, uh, you'd read in like u, v, w, and then you would push back like v comma w as a pair. Any questions on this? This is like a uh, very standard uh, way to read in the graph input. This will come up in like basically every single graph problem with like the modifications we talked about. Like if it's weighted, then you add in the pairs and if it's directed, you only do the one direction. But yeah, besides that, this is like very standard. OK. All right, so now we have uh, the idea of connected components, where we say that u and v are in the same connected component if there is a path between them. Uh, and this is specifically for undirected graphs. Um, for directed graphs, there's uh, something called strongly connected components which are a bit more complicated. We're not going to get into that here. Um, but yeah, this is specifically for undirected graphs. Um, so we say that they're in the same connected component if you can like sort of get between them using the edges. So in this case, uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all on the same connected component because you can get between them using the edges, right? Like to get from 3 to 4, you can do that. And from 4 to 1, you can do that. And that holds for any pair. Uh, and then 5, uh, you can't do anything with the edges. So that's in its own connected component. Um, and we say a graph is connected if there is only one connected component. So everything is reachable from everything else. OK, any questions? If you guys have questions at any point, uh, feel free to ask, because there's this is a lot of definitions. OK. 
Um, so now we're going to get into trees, which are um, a type of graph that comes up in a lot of problems. Um, it's kind of like its own sub subclass of problems within graph problems. Um, so basically what a tree is, uh, is there's a bunch of different definitions that uh, they like to give in like the problem statements. Like instead of telling you this graph is a tree, they'll tell you like one of these things and then you have to like sort of figure out that it's a tree from that. So these are all very useful things to know. So um, it's a connected graph with no cycles. So basically what a cycle is, is um, you can go from one vertex through some other vertices and then back to your original vertex without repeating an edge. So like in this graph, one, two, three would be a cycle uh, because you can get from one back to itself uh, without repeating an edge. So if we have a connected graph with no cycles, then um, that would be something like this, right? Because if you start here, there's no way to sort of get back there without reusing an edge. Um, An equivalent definition is it's a connected graph on n vertices with n minus one edges. Um, and the way you can sort of see this is if you imagine like building the tree out. So if you start with like a single vertex and then at every step you add a new vertex with like one edge to it, um, then like, so you start with just this vertex, then say you add like this vertex with this edge and you like keep it connected. Um, when you're adding the new vertex, you're only connecting it to one other thing. So there's no way that that makes it part of a cycle. So after you do like n minus one of these additions, uh, you know that you still can't have any cycles. Um, so I'm not sure if that makes sense, but that's one way to think about how these two are equivalent. Um, and then another definition is there is a unique simple path between every two vertices. So we know that it's connected, right? So we know that there has to be at least one path. And uh, if there were two paths between two vertices, um, like say in this graph, for example, we have two paths between one and three, then that would imply that there's a cycle. Um, because if you sort of take the union of those two paths, um, then there would have to be a cycle somewhere on there. Maybe not the whole union would have to be a cycle, but there'd have to be a cycle somewhere on the union of the two paths. Okay, yeah, so all these definitions are equivalent. Um, and the one other useful thing to know is that uh, the vertices that are only adjacent to one other vertex, so like these three down here and these three up here, uh, we call those uh, leaves. And those are very important in graph problems, in tree problems usually. Okay, um, so one really useful thing we can do with the tree is we can do what's called rooting it, which is basically we pick one vertex to be the root, and then we sort of imagine all the edges are directed away from the root, um, and you can sort of think of them as going downwards. Uh, so like in this example, if we make one the root, we sort of direct everything else downwards, and now every other vertex has a parent. So two is the parent of three, um, four is the parent of six, one is the parent of five. And uh, note that this doesn't have to be like a binary tree or anything like that. We can still have uh, any number of uh, edges coming out of the root or any of the other nodes. Um, so it's not, it doesn't have to be like a binary search tree or anything like that. But yeah, questions on this? Cool. Okay, so now we're gonna get into graph traversals, which is basically a way to uh, explore all the vertices in a graph given some starting point. Um, and really the question is like, what order do we want to explore the nodes in? And uh, there's a lot of ways I guess you could do it, but really you only ever use two. So the first way is BFS, which is basically, uh, so you start at your starting point, and then you explore all of the neighbors of your starting point, right? So we explore two, three, four, and then uh, we look at all of these vertices and we explore all of their neighbors in order. So then we do five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and then the only one left is nine. So then we do nine. So you're sort of expanding outward 
uh, all at the same time. You're, you're sort of uh, exploring them in order of their distance from the root. And for that reason, uh, you can use it to compute the shortest paths in unweighted graphs. So in weighted graphs, we have to be a little bit more careful. But for unweighted graphs, you can use a BFS to get the distance from every vertex to the root. And uh, the way we usually implement this is using a queue or a vector or an array list or whatever. Um, so what you can do is push all of the neighbors to the back of the queue um, and then explore the vertex at the front of the queue. So the implementation, oh wait, is the implementation slide not here? Okay, yes, yeah, so the implementation for BFS uh, would sort of look like this. Um, so we have our vector uh, in the graph, right? So this is the representation we had before of the adjacency list. Um, and we can also store the distance to um, from the root to every node. So if we're doing a BFS from the start node, uh, we initialize all the distances to negative one to represent uh, that we haven't seen these vertices yet. Um, and then we have this queue uh, that represents the vertices that we sort of have seen, but we haven't fully explored yet, which we call a fringe. Uh, so initially we just put the start node in there um, and set its distance equal to zero. And then what we do is while we have something left in the fringe to explore, um, call that vertex U, right? And then we remove that from the fringe. Then what we do is look at everything adjacent to U. And if the distance is not negative one, wait, if the distance is negative one, right? Yeah, so if the distance is negative one, um, then we want to push that into our queue and set its distance, right? Because if we if the distance is negative one, this means we haven't seen it before. So uh, that means the best, the, the shortest path to it is through U. So the distance of that path is the distance to U plus one. Uh, and then we add it into the fringe and we continue. Okay, uh, questions on this implementation? Okay. Yeah, so then uh, the other way to traverse the graph uh, is DFS. So basically the idea is you wanna go down as far as you can, then backtrack up. Uh, and this is usually easier to implement than DFS um, because you can do it with a stack or uh, recursively, which is the way I usually do it, which tends to be uh, very short in terms of the amount of code. Um, but the one drawback is it doesn't give you shortest paths, even in unweighted graphs. So the implementation for DFS would basically look like this if you do it recursively. Uh, so we have our graph here and we have uh, a used array, which is basically representing have we seen this vertex yet. So if we've already seen the vertex, we don't want to explore from there because, um, so in the picture here, we have a tree. So that's not really much of a problem. But if we're in the general graph and we have a cycle, we don't want our DFS to keep going around the cycle infinitely. So we have to store which ones we visited so far so we know which ones not to visit in the future. And it's the same thing for DFS. That's why we did the check for not visited in the DFS code too. Um, so if we want to DFS from i, uh, the way we can do that is just set used i to be true, then uh, iterate through the neighbors of i that have not been used yet and DFS from them too. Um, so yeah, not much code, uh, usually very nice to implement. And you'd usually have like some other uh, code in here, like you do something else with like the neighbors of i, but this is all you need for like a basic DFS. I'm um, picking a question. Uh, this is maybe sort of related to what you were saying. Uh, now you were saying about uh, DFS trees and stuff. She said, do graphs that are not trees also have roots? Um, so the thing with roots is, so in some problems, they'll tell you like the trees, the, the, the graph is like rooted here. Um, but in a lot of other times, uh, you can just sort of arbitrarily root it where you want. And that kind of goes for like non trees as well. Like you usually, you usually want to think about it as with like some vertex as like the start point for your DFS or your BFS or whatever. 
And usually it doesn't really matter which one you pick. You can sort of pick any. And then, then there is the idea of like TFS trees where like you do kind of turn it into a tree, but that's a different thing. She's good. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay. So yeah, we went over that. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the problems. So the first problem is count connected components. So uh, you're given the graph in sort of the normal input form, right? So you get n, m, so number of vertices, number of edges, and then a list of edges. Um, and you want to output the number of connected components. And you can just say you've already constructed the adjacency list, because that's, uh, like we said, that's like a very standard step. So yeah, again, for like this graph, you have two connected components, you output two. Anyone have ideas for that? Yeah, I can look at chat, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you guys both have it. So basically what you want to do is uh, do a DFS or BFS from every node that we haven't visited. Um, so basically what you do is you iterate through all the vertices in order. Um, and if we haven't used the current vertex yet, then it has to be in a new component, right? Otherwise, we would have visited it during a DFS or BFS. Um, so we it must be in a new component. So we do a DFS from there and sort of fill that component. And then uh, your number of components is just your number of DFSs. Um, so the implementation for that would sort of look like this. Uh, this is actually the exact same DFS code that we just had, because we don't have to do anything extra with it. All we have to do is fill the used array for that component. Oh. Uh, this should have used i equals true. That is, yeah, that should be there. All we have to do in this DFS is fill that used array. Um, so yeah, then all we do in the main after we read the input um, is we can set the number of components initially to be zero. And every time we encounter one we haven't seen yet, we do a DFS and increase number of components. Okay. Any questions on this code? Okay. Nice. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna talk about bipartite graphs. So basically uh, we say a graph is bipartite if we can split the vertices into two sets such that there is no edges within any of the sets. Uh, so what we mean by that is like, let's say you have a graph here. Um, we can show that this is bipartite by putting one, three, and four in this set and two and five in this set. And notice that every single edge goes between the sets. Like you don't have any edges. If we look at just one, three, and four by themselves, there's no edges there. Same thing if we look at just two and five by themselves, there's no edges. Um, yeah, so then this graph is bipartite. And one useful fact about bipartite graphs is a graph is bipartite uh, if and only if it has no odd cycles. So for example, if you have like a triangle in your graph, uh, which would be a, a cycle of size three, then there's no way to put those three vertices into these two sets such that um, no edge is within a set, right? Because you have to put two of the vertices in the same set and you have an edge between all three pairs. So that's automatically going to make it not work. Okay. Uh, another, so that, way, yeah. sorry, another way that it's often expressed as opposed to two, in the two set, the way the two sets are expressed is in terms of colors. So you talk about like coloring the ed, the nodes uh, either red or black, so that no two black nodes have an edge between them and no two red nodes have an edge between them. And that's a, sort of a nice way to picture yeah. the two sets. So that uh, leads into our second problem 
which is how do we detect if a graph is bipartite? So for example, given this graph, uh, it has a triangle in it. So like we just talked about, it can't be, so we would output no. So for this problem, um, don't think as much about like the whole odd cycles thing. Uh, that's a useful trick to know for bipartite graphs in general. But in terms of this problem, it doesn't really matter as much. Yeah, all you need to do is put yes or no in this case. The same ap approach would work if they also wanted to output some coloring that actually works also. Some, some splitting yeah, that's of, true. Of, the, of the nodes into set one and set two. Yeah. Um, so the odd cycles thing would be useful, but the, the thing is, it's kind of hard to detect that. Um, so there are ways that you can detect it, um, but it's going to be harder than the solution we have here. So a hint for this problem is uh, the thing Akif was talking about is very helpful. Like thinking about it as a coloring, like assigning, like you want everything to have one of two colors. Another hint for, in that same vein is that uh, Note that it doesn't matter which ones you color black and which ones you color red. So, so if you flip the colors, it shouldn't matter, right? If you have these guys color black and these guys red, you could just as well color these guys red and these guys black. So. Yeah. That is how you do it. So basically the idea is we can just use a DFS. So. Uh, like Akif was talking about, we want to assign every vertex one of two colors, such that no adjacent vertices have the same color. And the idea is we can do this greedily. So um, assign the first vertex in every component some arbitrary color. Because again, it doesn't matter if you flip the reds and the blacks. Um, it gives you the same answer. So all the vertices adjacent to that have to be the opposite color. And then all the vertices adjacent to those have to be the opposite of the opposite color. So we just sort of iterate out through that, we can use DFS or BFS again. Um, and we just repeat this until uh, we visited everything or we found a contradiction. So what the code for this would look like is, so we have our normal graph representation. We also have uh, a color array. So we let color be zero for vertices that we haven't seen yet. And one or two for vertices we have seen. So one, meaning like red and two meaning black or whatever. And then we can have this uh, global Boolean bipartite that tells us is the graph bipartite. And initially we'll set it to true. And if we find a contradiction, we set it to false. So then um, we can read the input and then we do sort of the same idea we had in the last one where we iterate through the vertices in order. Um, and if we haven't used them, we do a DFS. And again, it doesn't matter what color we make the first vertex in the component. So we can just arbitrarily set it to be one. And so what the actual DFS in here looks like is uh, so DFS of I and color, basically. So we set the color of I to be C. 
which is sort of the equivalent of setting used i to be true in the previous problem. And then we iterate through um, everything next to i. And there's two cases that we specifically care about. So if we haven't visited j yet, we DFS from j with color 3 minus c. So notice that 3 minus c, if you have a color 1 or 2, it's just going to flip it. So it turns 1 into 2, it turns 2 into 1. So we're sort of DFSing from j with the opposite color. Um, otherwise, uh, if they have the same color, like if j and i are both red or whatever, then we know it's not bipartite. And um, the third case is when color j uh, is the opposite color to color i. And we don't care about that, because that just works. So like if we've already visited j, and uh, it is the opposite color uh, of i's color, then that's fine. That's not a contradiction. And then at the end, after we've done all these DFSs, all we have to do is print out um, whether bipartite is true or false. And note that, uh, like Akif was saying, you can also recover the coloring too, because we have color here, which uh, is one or two based on which set we put it in. So if we had to print out which set to put each of the vertices in, we could just print out the color, because we do have that information stored as well. Questions on this code? Okay. All right, so problem three. Um, we represent a country as a weighted tree rooted at vertex one, um, where the weight of each edge is the time you need to cross it, basically. So you start at the root, and you want to visit every city at least once. Uh, what is the minimum amount of time you need to do this? So for example, if this was your tree, the optimal solution would be to go uh, 1 to 3 to 4 to 3 to 1 to 2. And that gives you a total weight of 7. Uh, here, the nodes in the trees are the cities that Joe's talking about. Yes, yeah, the, the nodes are the cities. And yeah, it's kind of similar to the last problem in that we don't need to output the exact path, um, just the total weight, but we do kind of generate the path by doing this. Not, not really explicitly. It, it, don't worry about generating the actual path. Um, the total weight is really all that matters. Ambika um, has close idea, but she's kind of off, I think. I, I mean, she, she, has, she has the right, definitely the right idea, but... Uh, yeah, it's on the right track. Oh, yeah, so there was a question earlier about uh, it not mattering whether we use DFS or BFS. So, um, yeah, in a lot of problems, it doesn't, like the ones we've done so far. Uh, but like Akif said, uh, if you want, like, the shortest path in an unweighted graph, then you have to use BFS, because DFS won't give that to you. But in most other ways, they're the same. Uh, the things for tree problems also, right? DFS is often preferred, because then you operate on all the children of some node at once. And then get and sort of construct that back into some answer for that specific node. So, so you the other way also holds true. We sometimes you want to use DFS over BFS. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you you do want to minimize the amount of times you retraverse the heavy edges. So, I'll give you guys this hint. Um, 
So think about how the problem would change if we had to return to the root at the end. Um, so like you guys are saying, you think about how many times we are retraversing every edge if we had to return to the root. Yeah. Okay, so you had the answer. Um, so if we were in the case where we had to return to the root, um, so then the answer would be two times the sum of the weights, uh, because every edge you have to traverse once down and once up, right? So like in this case, no matter what you do, like let's say this was your path, uh, you have to traverse every edge at least twice. So you could go like down and then up, and then this is sort of doing a DFS on the tree. And then you're back to the root. Because the idea is you can't just go down on the edge, because eventually you have to go back up and get to the root. So if we had to get back to the root at the end, then the answer would just be two times the sum of the weights. So um, how this changes if we can end at any arbitrary vertex, uh, like you guys are saying, is we want to end at the furthest vertex from the root in terms of total weight. So let's say these were all weight one, then eight would be the furthest vertex from the root. You could also do seven. Um, and then we sort of just get rid of this path from eight back up to the root. And note that there is still a valid DFS that gives us this ordering. We can go from one down to three, back up to one, down to five, back up to one, down to seven and then over to eight. Because for any leaf, um, you can make a DFS where that's the last leaf you visit before you go back to the root. And your furthest vertex in the root is always guaranteed to be a leaf. Because if there was something below here, then that would be strictly further. So now all we need to do is find what's the maximum distance to the root. And we also need the sum of the weights. So the code for that would look like this. Um, so here, uh, this is our standard representation for uh, weighted graphs, right? So instead of a vector of ints, we have a pair of ints where dot first is the actual vertex and dot second is the weight. Um, and we can store the maximum distance in some global variable. So, um, and then after we read the input and get the sum of the weights, all we have to do is a single DFS down from the root, which in this case would be vertex zero. Um, and then after that DFS, we have max disk filled, so we just print this out. So the way the DFS works in this case is you have DFS of uh, the vertex, its parent, and um, the current and the distance to the root. Um, so we're sort of using a nice trick here that you can use for DFSs in a tree, which is you'll notice we don't have any uh, used array um, or like the color array from the last one. Uh, we don't need to store like an extra array for that. The way we do that is by passing in the parent. So if you uh, have some tree and you're doing a DFS, like let's say we've just entered four, we know that uh, everything below four is unvisited. So the only visited vertex um, adjacent to four is its parent. So as long as we make sure we don't go back to the parent, then the DFS will never visit an already visited vertex. So instead of storing like this whole used array or whatever, we just have to pass in the parent to the DFS function. Um, and then when we're checking all the neighbors, we just make sure that we're not going to the parent. OK, so uh, for the rest of the DFS, basically, uh, we set max dist to be um, the max of itself and the current distance. Um, so initially, when we're going down from the root, the current distance is 0, because the root is 0 distance from itself. right? And then every time we go down to a, to a child, uh, we add in the weight of that edge. 
So, um, George, it's a question, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so it's if you if you Michael ask if you can use the oh, just gonna, yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. Uh, I I only read it. Yeah. Oh right, yes, okay. Um, so the reason this is different is because we are in a tree right now. So if your graph is a tree, then you can use uh, DFS, and that's fine because there's only one path. Right. So it, if you're in like some general graph, we have all these cycles and stuff. You have like a lot of different paths between two different vertices, right? But if you're in a tree, there's only one path from say the root to any vertex. So um, you, yeah. So if you get any path, then that's guaranteed to be the shortest path because it's the only one. Yeah. So for calculating the sum of the weights, you can do that. Like if you said, when you're reading the input. Um, because they'll give you all the weights in the form like u, v, w. So you just add up w over all of those uh, input lines. Yeah, so like at, you, you do it basically at the same time that you're constructing the graph. Okay. Any questions on this problem? Um, Michael, another question. Okay. Yeah, so the DFS works if you have a cycle in the graph, but uh, again, we have to keep track of the used array. So we have to have some way of knowing um, which vertices have we visited so far. Because right? we, we can't use the parent trick that we have for trees. Um, but like, if you look at the previous two problems, uh, those were for general graphs, um, like in the first one, the, yeah. So like in this problem, um, this works for a, any graph with the DFS, but we just have to keep track of used to make sure that we don't infinitely go in a cycle, basically. And again, this slide is missing the part where we set used, which is here. Yes, yeah, so every time we, we DFS from a vertex, we have to set it to be used. And then we're never going to visit it again in the DFS, basically. OK. All right, fourth problem, the tree diameter. So we have an unweighted tree. And you want to output the length of the longest path in the tree. So like if you had this tree, um, the length would be 5. So you could go from 3 to 7, and that's 5 edges. Or you could go from 3 to 8, which is also 5 edges. And um, again, this is another problem where you just have to output the answer. But we do. Uh, Actually, it depends on how you solve it. Uh, some of the ways you can solve it, you do get explicitly these nodes, and some of the ways you don't. There's actually uh, two solutions to this problem we're going to go over. Uh, so so, uh, give you guys a minute to think about those. Uh, Rajat had a question. Um, and so it's not the same, because before max dis was a max distance from the root. This is the max yes. distance within any two nodes in the tree. So you could example 3 to 8 here, because 3 is not the root. Yeah. So if we were looking for max distance to the root, that would only be three, because um, you have one to eight as the max distance. So if we iterated over all of the roots, right? So if we picked one as the root and we found the answer, and then picked two as the root and found the answer, um, then that would give the solution. Like if we did the max distance thing from the last problem, but the problem with that is it would be n squared time. And we want a solution in linear time. Yeah, yeah. So they, they so the wording that they usually use uh, is that they call it a simple path, which means a path that doesn't repeat any edges. Yes. I think that showed up in the slide where we talked about the definition of a tree. 
um, a tree is defined as you have only one simple path between any two nodes. Yeah. Oh, uh, Jason, I think, got the answer. Oh, nice. Uh, which one was it? Nice, okay. Um, yeah, so one solution to this is we're going to do uh, two BFSs slash DFSs um, from an arbitrary root. So let's just say we arbitrarily rooted a vertex 1. Uh, so you do a BFS or a DFS from the root. You find the furthest leaf. Um, and we're then going to reroute the tree at that leaf and then do another BFS or DFS to find the furthest node from that. Um, and then the distance between uh, these two leaves we found is maximal. So um, I kind of have a sort of hand wavy, kind of sketchy sort of proof for this. Um, so sort of the intuition behind it is uh, let's let RS be the path we generate. So like R is your first leaf node, S is your second leaf node. Um, and let's say that AB is some longer path in the tree. So they have to be connected somehow, right? Um, and if you sort of think about it in terms of a lot of different cases, there's no way that you can make AB longer than RS um, without contradicting um, R being the furthest from the root and S being the furthest from R. So for example, like in this case, this obviously doesn't work because uh, if R was the first one we found, if we do a DFS here um, to find the furthest vertex from R, we wouldn't find S, we would find A. And in, in all the other cases, there's sort of a similar argument you can make. But yeah, by doing this, we find um, the longest path in the tree. Any questions on this? Again, this isn't like a full proof. This is just sort of the intuition for why this idea works. OK, so there is um, another solution to this problem. Um, it's kind of a DP thing, um, sort of. So I'll give you guys a minute to think about that. It's less DP and more just a recursive DFS problem where uh, yeah. the solution for one node depends on the other guys. Yeah. So you want to have sort of some idea of what is the solution. Um, so like if you look at every node, like say you're looking at four, you want to find like what's the best path in the subtree of four, so in everything like below four. It's probably a bad example because there's not much below four, but yeah. So how, how can we sort of maintain something like that with DP? Or not really DP, but like recursively calculating it.
I guess we can just give this one because this one's probably harder to come up with. Um, so what you want to do is again we root the tree arbitrarily, so just say rooted at one, and then for every node we want to compute um, the two biggest distances to leaves in its subtree. So like um, you want to look at like the two children of this node that have the uh, maximum distances to leaves and add those up. Because um, let's say we're looking at vertex one, right? Um, so vertex two, you have a path of length two to a root. Uh, vertex three, you have a path of length three. Um, vertex five, you have a path of length one. So we take the two maximums, uh, the two maximum of those. So that would be two and three. And then the max uh, path through vertex one is two plus three. And then um, we want to look at only the max distance, which is three, and then add one to it. So like assume, like imagine one had a parent, right? If we add one to it, then that is now the max distance from the parent of one uh, to a leaf through vertex one. So we sort of pass, we take the second max and the max, we add them up. Um, that's one possible max path. We max that with like our global max variable, whatever. Um, and then we pass up only the max length path because sort of this is a path with like two endpoints below here. But when we're passing it up, we need to have one of the endpoints be up here. So we only take the max um, and we pass that up to the parent. Oh, whoops. Yeah, so this is basically what we're saying. Uh, so you, when you're passing up the max, you add one because you're sort of adding the edge between i and its parent. And so that, that sort of recursively gives you the answer because every path um, has to be of the form like going up until it hits some vertex and then going back down. So what we're doing is we're just iterating over all possible vertices where that could happen. Like if it has to go up and down through six, the only one would be like seven, eight or eight, seven, right? Uh, there's not a lot of branching here. So those are kind of the only examples. But like five through seven, that goes up to one and then goes back down. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so for the subtree, you either take the max plus second max, or if it only has one child, then you just take the, the answer for the child, right? Because like, for example, with vertex four, you have the max is two, but there is nothing else because six is the only child. So the answer for four would just be two. For a path that goes up through four and then back down, it can't go back down. So the answer is just two. Questions on this approach? Okay. Yeah, this one is probably harder to come up with, but it's a lot easier to prove that it's correct. Because um, with the other one, you have to do all kinds of like, you have to do all kinds of casework and stuff. Like with this picture, there's all sorts of different cases. But with this one, it, it's clear that like every path has to go up and down through some vertex. Um, so by taking the max of all of those, then you get the best answer. Okay, uh, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, as always, the slides are on Discord and we'll have the recording up soon. Uh, so on Wednesday, we will do a contest uh, of graph theory problems so you guys get a chance to uh, test all of your new knowledge. But yeah, it should be fun. Hope to see you guys there.